Good afternoon, since it's now an afternoon session. Uh, that wasn't the original plan, but uh, we're glad to have you there. Thank you for coming. I'm William Vabenep. I'm a product manager and I lead the PM team for Big Data Services on Google Cloud Platform. And with me today is Reza. So Reza Rockney, I'm part of the Global Solution Architect team and I work directly with our customers, product management and engineering. So the, one way to start thinking about the value of Big Data is just by an example of um, what Google did with Street View. And so you're probably familiar with the feature. Um, a while ago, Google started to send cars you know, all over cities and then you know, more than cities, countryside, and, uh, and then more than cars eventually to really take pictures of uh, many, many parts of the world. And originally, this was really just a feature of Google Map. The only reason to do that was that uh, it would be nice when people look at a destination on Google Map to show them what the place looks like um, that they're looking at. And so that was a great feature. We needed pictures, take the pictures, uh, and show that on the map. What's very interesting is that over time, as technology improved and as the cost of technology, um, especially at scale, went way lower, there, there, a lot more uh, data was accessible from those images. And so today, all those images going back over time to many, many years, um, in addition to being nice to look at, can be used to extract data from them, such as, in this case, uh, you know, the street number, the signs, the, you know, what the display, what's in the window, you know, what, what product is advertised at that point of time in the window, um, and really a lot more information that suddenly gives a, a lot more perspective on what's happening in the world. And so the reason why I like this example, um, it's not that this is not a talk about vision API or you know, something focused on images. It really illustrates the fact that there is very often a lot more value in the data than the original purpose for which the data was collected. Um, and in due time, as the technology improves, as the costs go down, as it becomes easier and easier for everyone to process data, that data gets uncovered and its value realized. And, and the fact that you're here today, um, that really puts you in the same position as the, as the MAPS team. You, know, you, you, know, you now, you know, by virtue of being here and being in this conference and going to the various sessions, have access to uh, very powerful technology that's much easier to use and much easier to operate. And so that's what we're going to discuss today. Um, you know, let's start with a few other applications. So you know, the image one is a very nice one to start with uh, because it's very visual. There's many other ways that data is used productively. The way I like to think about it is to break it down in two categories. There is a set of use cases where data is used to inform humans. You know, a human has to make a decision. It would be nice if that decision was informed by, uh, re by, by relevant data. And so you know, that's a more traditional model of analytics, business intelligence, um, and that's still very important, uh, obviously. And so uh, you know, some examples here where you can get uh, a much, much, much more complete insight into your supply chain, much more timely insight as well. And so you know, if one part of your supply chain, one partner is, you know, is, is causing issues, you want, to, you want to be able to know that for sure, as opposed to you know, having an intuition that that partner really, you get lots of complaints about them, um, and getting that insight uh, quickly when you can act on it. Also, you know, another example of use case, well, I'm a product manager, so you know, I make product decisions uh, quite often. It's nice when you can make those decisions based on actual data as opposed to insight. You know, we all think we have great intuition, um, and we all fool ourselves when we think that. And so data can be used to better understand user behavior, to run experiments, you know, launch a feature or a version of a feature to a set of users and really compare how that affects the behavior. And so you know, this just a few examples of cases where data is used to inform humans who make decisions. And then, more and more, there are cases where the human, the human is out of the loop, where the analysis of the data is used directly to affect the behavior of your applications. Now, the most typical example that we see all the time is when you go shopping, you know, depending on what you've bought, what you purchase, recommendations, you know, that's well understood, um, you know, and that's, there's no human, you know, obviously making those recommendations. Um, but it goes way beyond that. You know, there are many systems where uh, you just wouldn't have the time for a human anyway to react. You know, when you're looking at financial uh, transactions happening very quickly, and, and time is money, you know, fraud you know, has to be stopped right away. 
it just wouldn't be possible anyway, even if you had armies of humans, to do it manually. And, and that's why you want the machine to act automatically um, or to resolve issues and automate processes. So these are some of the examples. Obviously, to make them happen, you need to actually have access to data. Uh, and people sometimes wonder, well, you know, do I really have access to the kind of data? You know, I don't have cars going all around the world taking pictures. I don't have that kind of data which has you know, powerful insights. Um, and in reality, if you take a step back and think about your data, you need to think much more broadly. You know, obviously, there is the data that you already analyzed today. You know, and that one, you, know, you usually know it quite well and have a good sense of the value um, that can be extracted from it. But then there is a lot of data that you collect but don't really analyze. You know, maybe you collect it because you know, that was the default configuration, is to collect all that data. Or you collect it because some people want to be able occasionally to go do a point lookup and find out you know, what happened that day at that time. Well, let me go in the log and figure that out. But there's really no rigorous, holistic use of the data in that context. Um, and so that data really is, is you know, directly available for, for more advanced processing. And then there's a lot of data that you could collect but don't. Because you know, if you don't have a plan to do something with it, wh why would you bother? Why would you collect it? But as you get access to the technology, as that technology becomes easy to use, it really uh, makes sense to start thinking more around, well, maybe I could instrument this. Maybe I could collect that data and bring it. And then the fourth category is data that you don't necessarily create uh, and generate, but that you could get access to by asking somebody. And so one example would be uh, data from commercial providers or, or other third parties um, that you could you know, either have an arrangement with or purchase, or data from your partners uh, who would be willing to integrate more closely with you. And so I would encourage you to think a lot more broadly about data that's available um, on the platform. You know, one of the things we announced this morning in the keynote um, is that we now have a BigQuery transfer service, which is going to automate bringing your data, your marketing data at Google from AdWord, from DoubleClick, from YouTube if you're a publisher, directly into cloud. We also work with commercial data set providers like Dow Jones to make data available directly. So there's really a big universe uh, of data available to you. Now, on the downside, um, historically, it's been hard to use data, which is what, why you know, many people haven't done it. All those who've done it, you know, installed a Hadoop cluster and you know, tried to uh, get some value there, have you know, often found that pretty painful. Um, and one of the points that has made that painful is that um, you had to, you know, that data rarely comes in a way that's ready to use and ready to process. You have to prepare it, you have to clean it, you have to get it in the right shape, and that's been challenging. And so one thing, that we introduced this morning um, is a new service on Google Cloud called Google Cloud Data Prep, specifically to address that and to address that in a way which does not require uh, writing code and, and having access to developers. So it's empowering the end users of the data, those who understand the model, those who understand the, the content of the data to help themselves um, and prepare it for analysis. And so rather than waving my hands and describing it, I'm going to do that via an example. Um, and a demo. And so let me set up the example. Um, the, 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 the use case here is you are a retailer and you have transaction data. So every time somebody does a purchase, that's a new row um, on that transaction table at the top, uh, which contains, you know, among other things, all the products that were purchased. And so you get one row. If you buy five products, it's one transaction, one row. And then within that row, you see that there is that uh, array of JSON object. And so there is each product purchased was one just an object about that product all together in that array. Um, and so that's nice. You have all your data. Um, but here, what we're going to try to do is to map that product purchase to an ad impression that may have influenced it. And so the second data set is ad impressions, uh, you know, what, what, uh, what ad about what product had been displayed to what user. And so what we're going to try to do here is simply let me see if they are, what are the instances where a given customer purchased a given product after that same customer has been shown an ad for that product? So, you know, it's not rocket science. It's something any uh, business person should be able to express. But in practice, when your data looks like that, you know, uh, there is quite a bit of work to be able to extract that because in my retail data set, the, the product ID is buried 
um, you know, within all the product uh, purchased in that one transaction. And then in the advertising data set, the product ID is a parameter in the URL. And so normally, I would have to write quite a bit of code um, to go and, and extract that data and do other cleaning needed. And so if we can switch to the demo, uh, demo screen, we're now going to show how to do that in Google Cloud Data Prep. Okay, can I have the demo laptop on, please? Okay, we're on, yes. So this is the, the empty UI. Um, nothing has been loaded. The first thing we're going to do is create a flow. So a flow is really the, uh, it's an organizational uh, envelope for a, a set of work you're trying to purchase. So we create this new flow. And the first thing we do is to add data sets to it. So these are the two data sets I mentioned. Uh, this is a CSV file in Google Cloud Storage. These are my add impressions. And this one is a BigQuery table, which contains my, uh, my, my retail transactions. So I just have to add them. And then the tool will automatically load these two. Um, in the case of the BigQuery table, you know, it can show me a preview of that table. The CSV file, well, you know, it's just a text file, so it's pretty messy, but already the tool infers some transformation to break it down by row, by column, um, and, 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 to, uh, and to discover that the first row um, contains the, the name of the headers. And so already, there is a recipe that has been auto-created with some simple transformation. Um, so now let's, let's make use of that. So we're going to start with the, the BigQuery table, and we're going to add a new recipe. And so a recipe is the way that, uh, that Cloud Data Prep works. In effect, what you do when you work with the tool is you create recipes that capture the way you want to prepare the data. And so here's the interface where you spend most of your time. Um, what it lets you do is interact with your data directly. Now, this is not like, it's not a, a tool when you have to think about the transformation you want to apply and then drag and drop components that represent that transformation. Now, you think starting from the data as opposed to from the transformation. And so in this case, you, know, uh, you recognize um, what I was showing on the slide of that, let me just expand the column a little bit, um, that, that uh, array of just an object, which you know, is pretty messy. If I expand one of them, um, there's quite a lot there. And so to try to make sense of this, all I have to do is click on that column. Um, and that's really the principle of the tool. In practice, the way it works is you click on the data that you're interested in, you know, and you indicate uh, via those clicks what you're trying to get done. And then at the bottom, you can see the tool suggests a uh, potential transformation that would make sense for, uh, for that data. Um, and so in this case, you know, I see there's one suggestion here, which is convert this one row which has an array into a set of rows. And so each item in the array becomes its own row. And so if I look at what this one would do, um, it, uh, if I go in the, in the preview, so right now I'm in the preview, and it shows me that, let me just close this here. It shows me that now, um, you see, where I used to have uh, an array of JSON object, now I have one JSON object, because what used to be one row per transaction is now one row per product purchased in the transaction. So if I, if I bought five products, I now have five individual rows, which is more convenient, because I'm looking for a specific product. And so I like that. And I'm going to add to recipe. Um, and so now, um, that, no, here are my rows already there um, in the recipe. So the next thing I want to do is I want to go inside that JSON object and extract specifically the product key. Um, now, there are many ways to do that um, because, again, the tool is going to try to guess and help me. So for example, I can click on the column again and then look at a suggestion, like the first suggestion, is to create one column per uh, per uh, variable in JSON. So I have 13 variables, you know, sales order, line key item, product key. I could just say expand that and create 13 different columns. And you know, that would be a good way to do it. In this case, I actually only care about the product key. So another way I could do that is I can just go and highlight product key. And like, that's my hint. And then the tool is going to think about that. Um, and then the suggestion is, do you want to create a new column using that product key variable, and that sounds good to me. You know, the preview looks like uh, what I want to do. I want to extract that product key. And so all I do is add that to recipe. I can close that little preview here. And then, sorry, wrong click. Here I have that new column that extracts the product key, now easily available uh, without having to write any code. So let's switch to my other data set, the advertising data set. And so remember, that's a CSV file. Um, and already, as I showed earlier, 
the tool has created some steps in the recipe to break down and to use the new line as a row separator, to recognize the column separator and the header. And you know, those steps sound good, so I'm going to keep them. Um, if I look at the histogram of the data for every column, I notice that for the even time, which is when the ad was displayed, there is some red here, and, and the red represents mismatched values. And so again, I just click on that, um, and then the tool asks me, well, what do you want? Do you want to only keep those values? Um, or do you want to delete those values? And in this case, you know, obviously, what, uh, what, what makes sense here is we to delete the values because this is not useful to me. And so I just select that choice, add to recipe. And now we can see that those mismatch values are filtered out and I can, I can keep working. Um, so let's keep looking at the histograms. Like for user ID, for example, there's a pretty smooth histogram here between various user IDs, except that one is very prevalent. So I click on it, and then, you know, again, the tool suggests, do you want to just keep that one? Do you just want to delete that one? Um, and so, well, at this point, I don't really know which I want to do, but let's say I would just want to keep it. Just show me the rows that I would be keeping um, if, I, if, I, if I, sorry, I keep the, wait, no, sorry, user ID. Yeah, exactly. So I'm just keeping that user ID. And then the thing that's interesting now is I see the even time for that user, and there's basically a click every second here. And so that's why that user is so predominant in my logs is that, you know, probably it's a robot that's just clicking every second. So I'm not going to keep it and, and doing the opposite. I'm going to delete that user. So now it shows me in red. Those rows are going to be removed. Yes, I like that. I add this to the recipe. Okay. So we've done some cleanup, removing invalid time values, removing suspicious users. Um, let's go back to the original goal which is to extract the product ID. And as you remember, um, this is the URL um, for, the, for the ad, and the product ID is embedded there. And so really all I have to do is to click, to expand one of them, and just give the tool a hint. It's like, I'm looking for this. And so first hint, and the tool thinks, oh, so are you looking for that specific value? Uh, well, no, I'm looking for a pattern here. So let me give it a second hint. So I'm going to close this one. Well, it's not just this one. Let me open another one. And let me select that pattern on another one. And so now it's like, oh, OK, I get it. You're not looking for that value. You're looking for that pattern. And it's making suggestions um, as in you know, where I would want to be looking for that pattern. And so here, for example, it's like, you know, digit followed by dash followed by digits starting after the equal sign. Like, OK, that's a good pattern. Actually, I'm going to make it more robust because there could be other, you have more variables. That could be other equal signs in my URL. So I'm going to modify the recipe. And instead of starting after equal, I'm going to have it start after PID equal. This way, I'll be more robust if there is more, uh, more patterns and more, more, more variables. Add that to the recipe. And so here it is. It created this new column, uh, URL1. It just adds a 1 to the original one, um, which contains those product ID that have been extracted. And so let's rename it to something a bit more uh, useful than uh, URL1. And uh, so this is the product ID. And then you know the renaming, that's another step in the recipe. Um, and you don't have to worry about optimizing the steps you know, and doing the filtering before the renaming. Like All that will be optimized automatically for you. So don't worry about that. Just express what you want to get done. Um, and now we have those two data sets. We've cleaned them. We've extracted the product ID. Um, now we can join between them. And so let's do that directly in the tool. There's a join that you can apply. Um, actually, let me, yes. So now it's asking me which, uh, uh, again, what I want to uh, join that current, um, that current asset. So I'm going to join it against the retail data set, which I've, uh, which I've prepared. So select the preview. Let's pick the join keys. And so it's going to look at my data and try to infer the join key. And what it suggests is to join product ID from the ads to product key from the, from the transaction. And that, that's one. Uh, that's a good one. I like that one. But remember, I'm trying to look for um, uh, a purchase of a product by a given user if that same user has seen the ad for that product. So I also have to add an additional uh, pair of set of join keys uh, to do on the user. And so it's suggesting to join the user ID. OK, that looks good. But user ID with product key, I do not want this. So I can edit. 
Um, and uh, what I'm going to uh, join with is the customer key. And so here we have two, two uh, pairs of keys, product ID to product key, user ID to customer key. Um, that's what I want. I can select which columns I want to keep in the result of my join. And so here, I want to compare the time difference between the two. So I want to pick the event time, and I want to pick the uh, order. Where is the order? Order date. There it is. And I can pick you know, any other I want, obviously. And then add that join to the recipe. And here I am, back in the, uh, in the data-centric UI, to show me the, the result of that join uh, across those keys and with the time. And so in many cases, you know, maybe that's, that's the kind of cleaning I want to do. Like I'm done here. I don't have to do the difference between the two times, because I will do that later in my visualization tool. Or maybe I want to do it here. Maybe I want to add some more. And so I can select the event time. Um, and then I select, where's the other one? Uh, the order time. What happened to the order time? There it is, the order date. And now, if I, select this, if I select those two, when the tool suggests me is to create a new column, yes, except I want the time difference. There it is. And so here, the tool suggests to create a new column where the value is the time difference between those two uh, dead columns. I like that, except seconds is probably too granular, so I'm going to modify. And instead of seconds, I'm going to do it, um, express it in minutes. Add that to recipe. And oops, sorry, wrong click again. There we go. So we have that new column created that contains the result of the calculation. Let's rename it something more useful. So we're going to call it um, time difference. Add to recipe. And so again here, let's add it. Why is my rename? OK, did I click in the wrong place? Oh, here it is. It was already added, so I click it twice. Um, and so I have now that new column that's added to do the time difference. And so you know, as you can see, without writing a line of code, um, just by interacting with my data and pointing at things I want to do choosing columns I, I, I want to use together, I was able to describe that pipeline, which I can then execute. And we'll talk about data flow, the underlying service. Um, but the thing to know in that context is that your job is done. The execution is, at that point, fully automated. You just have to run the job. There is nothing to deploy, nothing to manage. Even if your retail transaction is you know, terabytes and terabytes in size, it's going to run in Google Cloud, execute, and deliver to you the result of that transformation. So let's go back to the slides now, please. And so that was a demo of how, without writing code, you can do a lot of very typical, common, um, and useful transformation steps. Now, there are cases where this is not the right tool. You know, there are you know, a lot of more advanced, uh, you know, with pretty complex processing algorithms, you know, with branching logic, where really code is the right way to express your transformation. Or maybe you want to run a streaming pipeline. Um, and so in that case, you, know, you, you want to write code because code is the best way to express that. But you still want to do that in a way that's friendly and productive. And historically, that hasn't been the case. Um, you know, historically, a lot of large-scale data processing, the tools available have been designed for the convenience of infrastructure and not of the user. You know, so take MapReduce, for example. You know, I mean, MapReduce is awesome. And Google was built on MapReduce. But really, MapReduce forces the developer to learn a new way of thinking, and especially if they have more complex uh, uh, pipeline they have to optimize, it's actually a lot of work to write really good MapReduce. Um, but it's very easy then, once you've done it in MapReduce, for the infrastructure to parallelize your work. And so that was the trade-off. But that has limited access to big data to a much smaller subset of developers. Um, and that really doesn't have to be anymore. Same thing with Batch. For some reason, as an industry, we tend to assume that there's something natural about Batch, that, you know, of course, you know, things at scale happen in Batch. And in reality, there's really nothing intuitive about that. You know, it's just the force of habit that makes us think about batch. You know, the world doesn't work in batch. You know, things happen continuously. And so you know, the tools have been forcing us to think in batch mode when really we shouldn't. Um, also, they've been forcing us to think about object in terms of uh, events, in terms of when, when they're processed, when they arrive in your, in, in your, in your uh, processing logic, as opposed to when they actually happened, which is not always the same. And so, 
the, 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 the reason why right now there's a lot more uh, easy access to big data is because those constraints have really been removed by a much more mature uh, programming model, and Reza is going to uh, tell us about that. Thank you very much. So um, it's been uh, uh, the last couple of years, I think I've been very, very lucky in that I've actually worked directly with our customers doing a little bit of that code stuff to actually convert batch processing pipelines over to streaming. And actually, before we talk about data flow itself, let's think about how we're going to collect this data. So let's just take two simple examples of stream data. One is IoT data. Imagine there's lots of factories that we have. Um, there is IoT devices measuring temperature, measuring number of machines that are on. All of these devices are sending information uh, to somewhere. And the other use case that commonly come across is clickstream. So as users are clicking around your applications on a website, they're doing stuff on their mobile, all of these events are clickstream information that's being recorded and being processed. Now, normally, obviously, that usually gets processed by batch processing. But as we move to stream processing, we now need a way of capturing that. And uh, Google Cloud PubSub API is a publish and subscribe API. There's no um, uh, running up machines. It's fully managed service. I essentially, and it's the easiest part of any POC that I do with customers, it's four or five clicks. I get a topic created. And what that allows you to do is from anywhere in the globe, you can send information to it. We can process it in any region that we like. It is highly available. And it means that when a message is recorded and acknowledged by PubSub, it will actually keep it in the system for up to seven days or until the subscription pulls that message and acknowledges that it's been processed. So this piece usually takes a few minutes to set up in any POC, and it will deal with several messages a second, or as with some of my customers, hundreds of thousands of messages a second. So going on to Dataflow itself, um, historically, it's been considered that if you wanted accurate processing, you tended to need a batch processing pipeline. So you would have batch technology. You would collect all the files at the end of the day, maybe do some corrections, some ETL, and then do some batch processing on it. Um, if you wanted low latency, you would then go and build a completely separate technology stack that would absorb these streams of data and do some processing for real-time dashboards, et cetera. Um, but it was always considered that that was not accurate enough for full uh, um, uh, for something like a billing uh, pipeline. Now, why is streaming difficult? Well, let's take that simple example of clickstream. Now, data, one of the common problems with streaming pipelines is late data. So imagine one of your applications is a mobile device. Your users are going to be going in and out of cell range. They're going to lose connectivity. They're still using, potentially, the application. As it's recording information, when it suddenly comes back online, it's going to send a clump of data. Now, if one of the things that we want to do is accurately count how many people are on the, our applications at any point of the day, at this point, we've got a problem because we're going to miscount. Now, what Dataflow allows us to do is it gives us a powerful programming model that is geared towards steer, uh, streaming. It can deal with batch as well. But what it allows you to do is deal with things like late data. It gives you simple primitives to deal with um, things like windowing and sessionization. And the uh, Dataflow programming model and SDK was uh, contributed to Apache Beam. It's now um, an open source project. And Apache Beam, uh, there are several folks building runners for it. So we have Spark and also other execution engines like Flink and Apex who are building runners. Now, very um, quickly, I'm going to show a demo of a Dataflow uh, running. So if we can move over to the laptop, please. Thank you very much. So Right now, we're connecting to the monitoring UI of Dataflow. And the example that's working here, for anyone who was at the session yesterday, this is an IoT example. There is messages coming from a factory. They have got temperature, et cetera, uh, encoded in them. What we're doing is we're absorbing that through PubSub. And Dataflow is pulling from PubSub. It's reading the IoT device data. We are parsing the message. We're pulling out little bits of information from the JSON package that's there. And then I'm actually doing three different types of processing with that data. So the first one, and I consider this like best practice always, is before any processing, I want all the raw data to be dumped to a repository. And with that, at this point, we're putting it into BigQuery, because then we can run SQL analysis against it. We'll come back to BigQuery in a moment. Um, and on the other side, we are doing some basic processing against the data. So here, I'm creating a simple sliding window. That's two lines of code. Then I'm doing a mean calculation. So within the last five minutes, what was the temperature? Then I'm doing a very simplistic check. If the temperature was over x, send the message back into PubSub. 
So here, PubSub is not only being used as the ingestion mechanism into Dataflow, it's being used as the glue to connect systems together. So I'm sending a message saying AC on or off, and then the factory can pick that up. More interestingly, down this middle path, so that was a simple, you know, is the temperature over 30 degrees? But down this middle path, we actually called the Cloud Machine Learning Service. Here, we have built a model based on data that we've been previously recorded in BigQuery, all that raw data that we should have recorded. It is um, able to then tell us what the optimum time to turn the fan is on. So here, instead of making that simple check, I make a REST call to the inference service on the uh, uh, model. It will tell me whether the fan should come on based on the heuristics that we, uh, based on the, um, uh, the cost optimization that we had in mind, which is efficiency. And it will then, again, we put it back into PubSub to uh, push back into our um, factories. Um, we're talking he heavily about retail use case here with the um, uh, sales data that uh, uh, William uh, put, uh, went through on data prep. If you, a simple example for retail would be take those IT temperature readings and imagine they're actually coming from stores. And what we're trying to do is what temperature should the store be set at to make sure people are spending lots of good money in your stores. Okay, back to William. And so we talked about the difficulty of writing pipelines and how you can now, in many cases, not even have to write any code, or if you do have to write some code, have a very powerful and, and convenient programming model uh, like Beam running on Dataflow, which Reza showed. That really is only the tip of the iceberg, though, in terms of the complexity usually faced in terms of running uh, big data in an organization. Quite often, the hard part that comes after that is how do you operationalize that? You know, okay, you've written your first uh, pipeline. How do you make sure it runs at scale with, right, with just the right amount of infrastructure? And that's often pretty complicated. Uh, and there are two main aspects there. One is the human aspect. It is a lot of work for people to have to deal with provisioning and, and patching and uh, reliability and security and performance and optimization and all those operational aspects um, which you have to deal with because you know by definition you know big data you know runs on a significant amount of, uh, of computing power so you have to manage it efficiently otherwise you're spending way too much uh, and it's just not doable and so in reality this is where you want to spend your time you know is bringing your business expertise to the data and not doing all the operation and trying to guess how much capacity you're going to need. And so there's a, uh, a human uh, a workload aspect um, and skill set uh, set of, uh, of constraints here. In addition to that, there is just resources. Like, how often have you found yourself feeling like you have a tiny shovel and a really big job? Um, and you're not getting the resources you need. Um, but that's because it's really hard to get large amount of resources, at least until you know for sure what you're trying to get done. Um, and the, the important thing is that you really want to encourage people to try things, to, to iterate, to fail quickly, to move on to the next thing. But if they cannot get infrastructure to support those experimentation, they're going to do toy projects. Um, and, and, and the solution here is what you know, the industry now calls serverless, which is an approach to data processing that um, takes care of all and automates all of the management and administration processes and allows you to focus on writing the job. So insight, business expertise, um, no administration. It also means that you get access to a lot of resources when you need them, but you only pay exactly for what you use. And so you know, if you have an idea in the morning, you can start and, uh, and, uh, and analyze large amounts of data to really validate your idea. Um, and if it doesn't work, you know, you've wasted an hour and $5 worth of, uh, of processing. If, it, if, on the other hand, it does work, well, you don't have a toy project that you have to throw away and re-implement at large scale. You have something which is built on services that can natively scale to any size. And so any experiment that is successful is ready to operationalize and productize uh, right away. And, and that's really the most important part is not that. It is that. It's not the technology. It's really the, the way teams learn to work and, and, and test ideas and iterate very, very quickly, as opposed to any new idea being yet another IT project. In practice, when I talk about serverless, well, there's you know, many services on the platform, but uh, the, the three that I would call out as, as the most obvious example um, have the NAS characteristic that they cover the three main stages of data lifecycle. And so Reza talked about PubSub for event ingestion. You know, nothing to manage, just create a topic and pump as many events as you want and only pay 
based on how much data you, you, you put through. Don't have to guess and pre-provision ahead of time. Data flow as well. You know, Riza described the, the quality of the programming model, um, but the thing that's really unique about data flow as a beam runner is it's a serverless system where you don't deploy a cluster. You submit a job, and then the job automatically gets the resources it needs auto scale. So whether you use data prep to create that job or you write it yourself, once you've created the pipeline, you're done. Everything else is automated. And then the third one, which we're going to talk about now, is BigQuery for SQL analytics. Again, serverless and at any scale. And so, Reza, please tell us about BigQuery. Can we go back to the laptop, please? Thank you. So what we have here is the BigQuery user interface. Um, I'm actually going to run a query, which is a little bit unusual. We're going to run a query over one petabyte of data. Um, the table in question is a retail uh, data set with a table sales partition. I can actually see the schema here. If I go to details, we see that it is uh, just over a petabyte of uh, data in volume and around a trillion rows, uh, well, just over a trillion rows uh, to compute. Now, uh, BigQuery is a column IO st storage format, so we don't, um, and actually it's been moved to capacitor since, uh, since its first inception. But here, I'm just going to do a select star, which is a bit of an unusual thing to do here. Um, and look for a single predicate. This is just to force it to compute against the whole data set. So I'm going to kit that off and get it to run. That will take a few minutes to actually, uh, sorry, that's been cached. Let me remove the cache. So BigQuery will cache results if you've run it before. Obviously, we don't want to do that. So let's get it running properly. So that's now going to run. It's going to take a few minutes. If we can go back to the um, slides, please. So let's think about what actually is a petabyte. So I'm going to show my age a little bit here and talk about floppy disks. So if you wanted to store floppy disks, um, a petabyte onto floppy disks, you'd have to stack up 12 Empire State buildings worth of them. Um, it would take you 27 years to download over 4G. Um, and it's every, t every tweet ever made uh, times 50. But that's a big number, obviously, petabyte. But it can also be a small number. So it's, j it's the data that's encoded in just two micrograms of DNA. It's one day's worth of YouTube video. It's 200 servers logging at a fair pace, admittedly, 50 entries a second for three years. So there's going to be more and more data sets that actually have these kind of volumes of data as we move forward. And where did BigQuery come from? So BigQuery is based on a technology called Dremel. And in 2002, Google had more and more data to store. Um, and the Google file system was bought. It allowed you to store all of this data in commodity servers. Fantastic, we solved the problem of how to store lots of data. By 2004, we had lots of data, and we had to figure out the problem of how do you process all of that data. So Jeff Dean and co, um, MapReduce was used, and it's very, it was very heavily used uh, um, to actually be able to process all of the data that we had. Now, when you're doing analytics, you don't just write the perfect query at the end. Um, you know, you wake up in the morning and you've got it all ready for you. You will look at your data. You want to analyze it. So you'll, if you're doing a MapReduce, you'd have to do some analysis with the first MapReduce. Then you will take the result set, look at that, do another MapReduce. And so our engineers got kind of bored with going off for coffee every time they ran that first MapReduce and building all the, the, the plumbing in between the stuff. And they wrote Dremel. And Dremel allows you to run queries against petabytes of data, as we're doing in the demo now. Um, and it's the same technology. Uh, that has been externalized as BigQuery. So it's the same code base, it's the same uh, SREs and engineers. And within Google today, Dremel is the core of our ad hoc analytics and web data warehousing needs. Um, most Googlers will touch it. Myself and William will touch it more directly, you know, things with Dremel. But however, um, uh, other people will be using it through dashboards. So now, um, OK, this query is still running. For, uh, for now, we're going to switch back to William. You talk about the, so you can uh, go back to the slides, please. You, you talk too fast. I do. Sorry. Um, and so, the, you know, speaking of the data and the way it's being stored and queried in Dremel at Google, at Google we have lots of different storage systems um, and lots of different processing systems. You want to go back to the slide for a second? Sorry. Yeah. Go back to the demo for a second. So I just needed to slow down for 20 seconds, and it would have been fine. So if we go back, um, that query completed. It processed a petabyte of data. took 161 seconds to complete. So that's 2 minutes and 40 seconds. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Back to the slides, please. So back to the slides. So 
The, one of the other issues that's been uh, preventing or making it harder to access and analyze data at scale is the, the siloed nature of the data. The fact that quite often data is within a tool, and if you want to use another tool to process it, well, then you have to extract it, move it, copy it, um, have different versions. Um, and at Google, we have lots of ways to store data and lots of ways to process data and lots of data between the two. And if we had to do that, that would just explode the data centers. And so one fundamental principle is that any tool can access data um, in any storage. Um, and that's really, really important in terms of allowing uh, a much broader uh, uh, um, uh, analysis uh, across sources of data set. And so in cloud, the way that, uh, the way that uh, materializes itself is with something like Dataflow, which Reza described, being able to access data in Google Cloud Storage, in, uh, in BigQuery, in Bigtable, that's our, um, uh, our NoSQL service, in Data Store, other databases that we have, in PubSub for Event Stream, wherever data is, Dataflow can get it and process it. Now, it's maybe less intuitive, but the same thing is true for BigQuery as well. And so, if you're going to try to go through a petabyte of data in, was it two minutes and 40 seconds? Like, you have to put the data in BigQuery storage because it's a highly optimized storage system for analytics. But in many cases, you, know, you don't have petabytes of data, and it might be more convenient to leave the data elsewhere as a file in Google Cloud Storage, um, in Bigtable, you know, or maybe just even in Google Drive. So you know, in my laptop, I can have a CSV file, which I drag, you know, uh, I drag in my Google Drive folder. It gets synchronized to Google Drive. And now I can write a BigQuery query that is going to join from that CSV file in Google Drive with you know, maybe a, a log table in BigQuery. And so BigQuery has that functionality to bring SQL analytics to all the structured data on the cloud. Um, and then finally, another product we haven't talked about yet, it's Dataproc for Manage Spark and Hadoop. Um, what it allows you to do is to bring the power and richness of the Hadoop ecosystem and Spark ecosystem to, um, to, to Google Cloud. Because you know, the key thing is use the right tool for the job. And if the right tool is a Spark library that somebody wrote, then you should be able to use that. And Dataproc will give you a fully configured cluster in about 90 seconds. Um, and that cluster, will have direct access to data, again, in those storage systems, such that the first thing you do is not load the data in Hadoop. The first thing you do is run the job. And so you can start a job, run, shut down your cluster um, when you're done, and you pay by the minute. And so it, you know, it's, it's standard Hadoop and Spark, but it enables them to run in a very dynamic, efficient, cloud-native way, and again, accessing your data wherever it is. And then finally, the last set of, uh, of issues that people typically run into is just the tooling to do something useful with the data. Because at the end, it's nice to be able to collect it and process it, but to what end? Um, and going back to the use cases, quite often that end is to inform a human. And, uh, and so there are tools that help you do that. Um, on the platform specifically, there are two main tools which are directly accessible. Um, one is Data Lab. Data Lab is targeted as data scientists. Um, and so for data scientists, uh, Jupyter Notebooks are a very popular way to analyze data. Uh, and what Data Lab is, is Jupyter closely integrated with Google Cloud Platform to allow data scientists to benefit from all the Jupyter modules and, and, and experience, but do that in a way that enables collaboration um, and, and usage on the platform. And Reza is going to show that in action. Yeah, and um, so the interesting thing about notebooks is um, it's the data scientist kind of scratch pad. They can, um, uh, as they're going through and analyzing the data, they can just record their results. They can uh, go back to them. They can use that even as something that you pass to the data engineers that's be me, um, to actually go and put into production. And the other thing, the, the great way that I've seen them used is at the end of their conclusions, after they come to what they think is the right way forward, they'll present the notebook back to their colleagues. And that's great because at the end, when they have that final result, uh, you might have a question like, why did you use column A and not column B? And they'll go back and say, well, actually, I looked at column A, and I saw a skew in the data. Therefore, I switched to column B. And it's a great way to actually maintain all of the, the knowledge that you gain as you explore your data set. So if we could switch to the laptop, please. What we have here is a data lab that's been, uh, that's been set up to run in Dataproc, our managed Hadoop and Spark. 
And what I'm going to do is actually use the data lab in conjunction with BigQuery, with in conjunction uh, with Spark, to actually do some uh, simple analysis against that sales data. So what I want to do is, um, as you can see, it is a, a you know, hands-on kind of technical tool. Um, what I'm going to do is look at the sales information. And the first question I'm going to say is, OK, so let's figure out how many uh, items there are in an average basket. So um, I would write a bit of SQL, um, run that cell. I would then call the BigQuery connector. It's gone and actually used the power of BigQuery to do the hard computation. It's given me back a table with eight rows. Now, the eight rows weren't sorted, OK? So I could go and rewrite the query with an order by. But actually, as I'm in the notebook, I'll just use the sort from um, uh, the data frame. Great. I can actually see now that, um, in general, there are number, you know, between 8 and 11, uh, it seems to be the average number of uh, items that we're going to have in a basket. Um, OK, interesting. Let's start doing um, a plot, a favorite tool. So great, we've got a visual representation of that data. Let's move on to a, something a little bit more tricky. So um, what I want to do now is figure out what are the things that are actually bought with each other. So um, that would be incredibly difficult to do with something like SQL, because you need to get the, the power set of all the um, uh, uh, items together. Um, so what I'm going to do is make a combination usage of BigQuery plus some MLib library uh, algorithms that exist in Spark. Um, I'm going to get the data ready in BigQuery. So what I'm doing here is generating a set of data. For this demo, I'm just limiting it to uh, 1,000 rows to return. And if we look at that head, what that's done is gone through all of my sales data and just concatenated all of the product IDs, the same product IDs you were seeing when um, uh, William was running the data prep demo. So it's put them all onto a transaction line. This is now perfectly ready for my algorithm. So I'm not having to do any work in um, Spark to get the data ready. So now I'm going to run, um, uh, uh, get this put into an RDD. OK, those are the 1,000 data sets that are there. Next step, I'm going to run the um, algorithm, which is this FB Grow from uh, Spark. Look at the results. It gave me 36 results. I'm going to look at uh, where items bigger than two. I won't go into the details of, of, of that. OK, so as I mentioned before, BigQuery does cache results. This morning, I had run the uh, limit 1,000, so I don't have to do some typing here. So the first thing I would do after um, uh, getting some results back is go and check them. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to use those product IDs, go back to my data set, and see if um, uh, what is it that people buy together based off category. So this seems building materials and outdoors. OK, interesting. At this point, we now have most of everything that's ready to pass to a data engineer. They can then go and productionize this and churn out the information across the whole data set to start figuring out what are the items we should recommend on our website. OK. okay. Back to the Back slides, to please. Thank you, Reza. And so this was Data Lab uh, for data scientists. You know, since this is a, an intro session, I, I don't expect many people in this room are data scientists. But people in your organizations or people you might work with who have that skill, um, that is the tool that will be most familiar with them and allow them to collaborate with you on the same data in Google using the tools they want. Um, for more business um, uh, analyst type of people, line of business managers, people who are more uh, um, you know, on, on that side of the business, uh, one tool that's on the platform that's quite useful is Data Studio for reports. And that's another serverless tool in the sense that you don't install anything, either on the client or on the server. Um, it, works, it, it works like Google Drive. It is a collaborative, um, a, a collaborative environment. And so I expect many of you are familiar with Google Drive and you know, having a presentation and documents and spreadsheets. And Data Studio allows you to, to use that exact same collaboration model um, for creating and sharing beautiful reports on the platform directly. And so let's look at it in practice. If we can switch to the, back to the laptop demo. So do you have it? Yeah. So this is a, uh, an example of a, of a, a report a dashboard in, um, in Data Lab, which has you know, some calculated value on the left side. So remember I mentioned in the data prep demo, uh, once I've extracted the time of the ad and the time of the, of the transaction, I could do the calculation back then in data prep, or I could leave those two values nice and clean and then do the calculation in Data Studio and, you know, and, and as part of the, the, the creation of, uh, of this report. Uh, either way would work. I can look at you know, my, uh, 
uh, uh, you know, my, my various uh, metrics here compared to target, etc. Um, there is the um, um, all of those areas are being controlled by that uh, debt item here, which was put there. So instead of instead instead of looking at the last quarter of 2014, I can go back and. Uh, look at the full year. And so here I'm acting as a viewer of the report, not as the creator. And so anybody with whom you share the report would be able to do that and, uh, and adjust the report to, you know, to get to what they're trying to get to. So I would just apply. It gets recalculated such that the revenue is now you know, the, the full year revenue, et cetera. And so that's one page of the dashboard. And there are other pages that shows other kinds of views. Like for example, I'm here having this uh, geographical view. So this is um, this one represents the, uh, the profit margin for various states, can uh, all, uh, hover over the various states, and automatically it you know, recognizes in the data geographical information um, and, and uh, offers visualization uh, specifically for that that allow you very easy as a, as a non-expert to put together those dashboards. You can look at the product, uh, so the demographics, so you know, find out more about the users and uh, what uh, you know, other data based on the customer tables in that retail data set. Um, do some filtering on that. So you know, remove the male users, for example, to filter down um, uh, to you know, just uh, to just let's say just all the female except the baby boomers. To uh, you know, and then you can drill in and automatically those selectors, whether the dead selector um, and or, or, or those uh, uh, population characteristic selectors. In, this, in the case of this dashboard, where, uh, where we're configured to apply to all of the visualization on this page. So that's the experience as a user. Somebody, someone has shared that with me. I know nothing about BigQuery or anything. I just have that easy dashboard that I can interact with and, uh, and get inside for myself. Uh, now let's look at how that dashboard actually gets created. And Reza, if you want to yeah, show sure. that in action. So if, uh, OK, um, what I'm going to do now is uh, do a little bit of UI, and there's a good reason they usually don't let me near any UIs, um, as will soon become apparent. Uh, so I'm going to, um, first of all, put this in edit mode and actually create a uh, page. So create new page. So at this point, I have a blank page to start um, building out some components on. And what I'm going to do is build out one of those first uh, graphs that we had in that first page. So um, what I want to do is a bar chart. So I'm going to put the bar chart down. And it's already given me some options. It's actually chosen average age as a metric. Uh, we want the uh, revenue. OK. Revenue selected. OK. If I recollect, the, um, uh, the style of the graph on that first page was horizontal. So let's turn that horizontal. There was also a uh, text bar at the top. So let's just add that. And my chart, it was also um, gray and black line. Let's put a weight around it, OK? And um, as I have very little UX skills, let's pick a color that I think is very beautiful. Gorgeous. That looks beautiful. So um, I think I might need some help from someone with a little bit more UX skills. So William, perhaps you could come and join me in this. So since that was shared um, you know, using the, the usual model, now I get, so you see my icon here showing up uh, because I joined that dashboard. And I can try. There's this beautiful picture. That's me. And I can go and uh, try and rescue this chart from uh, Reza's hand. So that's before people start leaving the room, let me try to change the color here. Yeah. Give me and this is my look no hands moment. And so go to the style section. So basically, what I'm seeing is the same thing Reza was seeing when he was doing the edit uh, himself earlier. And so chart background, let's make it like a nicer pink. That would How's that better? <laughs> <laughs> it's less, less aggressive. And then how about like this? How about that? <laughs> OK, now you can't I think read. We both need uh, to the day job, right? So anyway, hopefully <laughs> you guys, uh, and we, not, we haven't ruined your appetite for the rest. Um, let's do something maybe more useful. I'm going to add another chart. And so, well, speaking of uh, appetite, let's do a pie chart. Um, there it is, uh, showing up here. And so, you know, by default, the data was the product categories. Here, I'll make it bigger. So, Reza, you put yours right in the middle. You don't give me any room. <laughs> um, and so, you know, by, by default here, we had the, the product category. Um, oh, thank you. 
then I can uh, expand mine. And then, uh, you know, instead of that, I can uh, put other dimensions, like, you know, the age um, of my users um, or, you know, the gender of the user. So, you know, just as I compose, the, the key thing here is, for those of you familiar with drive collaboration, that's the usual experience where you see the other person um, and you can together collaborate. And so let's see, like, let's assume we've reached perfection. This is both beautiful and useful. <laughs> Please show us how to share it. 50% correct. So um, uh, we're going to share this document. If you use Google Drive, this will be very familiar with you. Uh, and um, so it's already shared. That link is already shared with uh, my domain, my company, uh, google.com. So um, anyone with that link can access this study set. If I wanted to restrict it further down, I could choose emails um, to uh, limit who has access to uh, this particular data set. OK, so back to William. Thank you, Reza. So yeah, it's a very, that's the typical you know, Google Drive sharing model. So very useful collaboration. If you can go back to the slides, please. Thank you. Um, and then uh, another aspect here that uh, we want to finish on is you know, as far as uh, big data processing, you know, more and more, that also includes machine learning. And so we announced yesterday that uh, machine learning engine is now GA. Um, that's, not, that's out of scope for this session. Plenty of machine learning sessions here. One set of APIs which are actually relevant uh, to people who don't have to be machine learning experts is the fact that you can uh, use uh, uh, APIs that expose models that Google itself has trained using our own data. And so there's the Vision API to extract insight from images, you know, what's in the image, uh, you know, recognize location, landmark, and a lot of things like that. Speech API to um, automatically transcribe voice into text. Jobs API, that's a pretty specialized API, but you know, I think that, that that's where the industry is going. In this case, having an API specifically for matching candidates, resumes, to job opportunity. And something that goes way beyond you know, typical keyword matching and really has uh, you know, has been trained on really, really large amounts of data and has much more insight about what actually makes sense um, to, uh, for, for, for matching. Uh, like recently, I was looking for a, uh, a, there was a, somebody who uh, passed me a candidate who has Apache experience, and I mean Apache's foundation, and he actually had worked on Apache helicopters. Thank you. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> not exactly what I was looking at. Um, <laughs> so that, that's the kind of thing that you know you can go beyond keyword matching and uh, and find people who are quite relevant for what you're doing. Um, another one is Translation API. I'm sure many of you have used it as consumers. Um, it's available as an API to use in your products and and, and in your uh, data processing pipeline. And finally, the Natural Language API, which takes text and uh, tells you what the text is talking about. You know, which which people, which location, what's the tone of the uh, 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 of the conversation? Are people happy, unhappy, and things like that? So that's an example of something that anyone, not a machine learning expert, can uh, can start using. And so, in conclusion, I think what we try to do here is to do a mix of explaining the value of serverless processing um, and how it brings scale, speed, efficiency, co and cost efficiency to be at our processing, but show how the way to use that in many cases is via very easy tools. And so we did a demo of data prep for data preparation. Um, we did a demo of, uh, of uh, Data Studio for data science, uh, sorry, Data Lab for data science, Data Studio for, for reports, um, and how those give you access to tools like BigQuery that can process petabytes, like Dataflow that can run pipelines in batch and stream, etc. So, you know, walking out of this, um, what, what I would encourage you to do is, of all the products we've shown, you know, go and see the session that drill deeper into some of those. And so some of those sessions actually happened yesterday, but everything is going to be on YouTube for you to catch up on. And so whether it is uh, you know, data prep, there's a session this afternoon that you know, is entirely about data prep, so you'll learn a bit more. There's also a code lab on the first floor where you can get your hands on it right away and start uh, playing with it. So you, know, you, you can go there. Or data flow, you know, learn how to use BigQuery. All of those are, um, are here for you today or on YouTube. So thank you very much, and thanks for being here.